Hey everybody, I'm Matt Valley, and welcome to today's episode of the Rock and Roll Research Podcast, where we share the super cool backstories and side gigs of the researchers and insights pros that you trust. Today's guest is Bill Travinger, who's currently the Senior Customer Insights Manager for private brands at a company we all know very well, Amazon.com. Uh, Bill has really an impeccable uh, client-side market research background, starting with Procter & Gamble back in the day. Uh, he's also worked with some other great brands like General Mills, Cargill, and Microsoft before joining Amazon.com. But that's all interesting in and of itself, but Bill has perhaps the most unusual side gig we've featured so far on the podcast, and I've I've been waiting and waiting and waiting for this call because <laughs> I need to hear more about it. Uh, but I'll let Bill tell you more about it. Uh, so welcome to the show, Bill. Thanks, Matt. Uh, great to be here, and I am so, so excited to have this conversation. This is one of my <laughs> absolute favorite topics that uh, I do not get to discuss enough. <laughs> so uh, happy to have the have the microphone for a few minutes. Excellent, excellent. Well, it's it's a topic that I enjoy quite uh, quite a bit myself. So we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that for sure. But uh, why don't we start by having you tell us a bit about your career, Bill, how you got into insights, and how you eventually found your way to Amazon. Absolutely. So uh, kind of as I was going through and preparing for our conversation, realized I've been in the industry now for about a decade. Um, I went back to business school in 2008 as the economy was kind of doing something similar to what it's doing now. Sure. And uh, I was 100% full speed ahead on, I was going to be a brand manager. Um, picked my school based on that. Um, mm -hmm. Was fully prepared to sort of make that transition. And as we started to go through the recruiting process, I had conversations, they were great. I liked what people were talking about, loved the marketing aspect. Um, and full disclosure, did not know that market research or insights was even a profession at that time. Uh, <laughs> same, same. So I just started to have these conversations with folks in that industry kind of through the process and was kind of really feeling like I'd found my people. The conversations felt natural. Um, really just had these great conversations around digging into the customer, understanding the behavior, driving strategy through that. Uh, versus some of the more tactical uh, intro level marketing kind of brand manager roles, which are, again, great roles. You learn how to run a business, um, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. Okay. And again, I, the advice I always tell people is like, I found my people um, when I talk to researchers. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I am now doing on the recruiting side or on the informa informational interview side, um, giving, you know, hard charging MBAs, that advice is just hated by I mean, universally, um, but I really believe it. So I genuinely kind of follow through with it and tell people that at any stage in their career, um, you know, find your people, remember those conversations you've had that have really sparked your interest or you leave the conversation feeling sort of, you know, lifted up from where you started the conversation. Um, Cause I truly believe that like through the course of your career, those are the people, places, ideas that you'll sort of naturally gravitate back toward. Right. Um, you know, whether it's a, a vendor partnership or just a mentorship or, you know, just a friend who you see at a conference and have beers with, like uh, that to me is kind of what makes, <laughs> what makes what we do fun is meeting interesting people, things like this podcast. Um, cool. And I, uh, yeah. So again, over the course of, of, you know, 10 years, you've mentioned all the great companies I've been at. Thank you for, for that kind, kind introduction. Um, and again, I encourage anyone to go to any of those companies. They're all fantastic. I learned a ton at all of them. Um, but what it made me sort of realize was, and there's some eh, some math here that kind of sort of works, but uh, I mean, that's five companies in a decade. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's the way of I, the world nowadays. It is. And it's one of those things I, I get a lot of questions about, is that too fast? Is that too slow? And um, I, as long as you're learning and building new skills and you're hearing, you know, finding new adventures to go on career-wise, I'm all for it. Um, if you're solely, again, the advice I always tell people is if you're solely just jumping to get the next title, um, you could do the same very quick progression. Um, but again, personal choices there. Uh, but I always just encourage people, if you hear about an opportunity, it sounds interesting, go for it. <laughs> um, I'm definitely not one to shy away from the idea of keep learning, keep growing. And, and again, it goes back to kind of finding your people. And if you have those conversations and they spark your excitement and you're kind of looking at your current role, like 
um, again, it's, as you said, it's the way of the world these days. So um, sure. I definitely harbor hard feelings. I don't think about that as, you know, resume, whatever. Um, I said, it's, it's just, just keep going, like keep moving forward. Yeah, sure. Well, you found, uh, you found a pretty cool gig at Amazon, pretty unique. Yes. And uh, would love to hear you tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, so it really is the culmination, I think, of that first decade of work, which is sort of why I really pursued it. Um, so I started as at a PNG. I started on Old Spice during the brand reinvention of Old Spice a decade ago. Um, mm -hmm. from an, again, I mean that's an HBR case for the you know for the next century. Yeah, the Terry Terry Crews story is like legendary yes. by now. Um, the you know uh, look at your man, look at me. I'm on a horse. Uh, we all. Uh, remember that commercial, but the inside side of it was um, we had, I mean, we had, you know, books and books of insights and research done on this like dying brand that again, the whole insight was it smells like my dad. Like that, that that's what it was. It smells like my grandpa. Right. Um, how do we break out of that? And uh, almost overnight, I'll call it, you know, a month or two, we went from being exclusively like kind of older guys to like tweens, truthfully, and teens thinking we're super cool and we need to capitalize on this. And how do we do it? Like, what products do we promote? What's, um, what's cool to teens? Like that is some of the most fun research I did was just going into their basement, like playing Call of Duty and having a pizza party with, you know, a bunch of 15 year olds, which now it sounds weird now that I'm just saying it. Um, <laughs> And, you know, just hanging out, like, what do you guys do for fun? Like, and then, you know, slowly winding the conversation to like, all right, like, you know, big dance at the high school tonight. What are you guys doing to get ready? Like, what's your, what's your bathroom routine in the morning? Um, and we always, we went in thinking it would be very nerve wracking, you know, guys at that age, not super keen to talk about that thing. Right. And they were the most confident people I've ever met. Like, I wish I had the confidence of a 14 year old <laughs> telling me, you know, how he, you know, uses a whole can of body spray every week. Um, <laughs> he's totally right. And it's the, it's exactly the right application. Um, so again, and that was just a really great foundational learning of like, here's, here's a brand that just turned over. What do we do? Uh, from there, I moved to Minneapolis and uh, was at General Mills for five or six years, uh, various roles, uh, big brands, um, meals division, yogurt division, and that's kind of where the food CPG piece really solidified for me. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, food research is just so fun. Uh, um, it's something everyone does, everyone can relate to. People are really passionate about uh, just, you know, what they eat, what they don't eat. They all have their reasons. Um, and just getting to explore that sort of very personal space for people is just such a great kind of piece of the business for me. Right. Um, but at the same time, again, it, I'd been in the grocery store now for seven years and wife and I kind of just realized we needed a new adventure. Um, and to preface that she'd been at General Mills that whole time as well. So uh, mm -hmm. we've both been at the, in the grocery store a long time and uh, we wanted a new adventure and transitioned to tech. So that's where I jumped. And I, I, we've done the very stereotypical Seattle thing. She started at Amazon. I started at Microsoft and we've since switched. So she's now, <laughs> I'm now at Amazon. Um, but I, that's where I really was able to learn like what skills are transferable and which aren't in the research world or like really what the importance of that is, is like, and that's when we kind of talking about switching roles and jobs. Um, are you building that toolkit that makes sense across industries? Um, mm -hmm. I think being able to say I've worked in deodorant and food and then coming and working in B2B like customer satisfaction tracking, um, really just cool to see that like, okay, I've, yes, I've, I'm still learning tech. Like, I don't know how software as a service works today. I can learn that, but like, have I built up this sort of bank of knowledge of like, you're asking these business questions and I know how to go answer them, or at least I have frameworks to go answer them with, and we can then tailor it to um, whatever Microsoft wants to do at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something um, we can get into a little bit later. I think the, the sales insight piece of that was really interesting. I was really partnered with our mid-market and small business sales team. Okay. So just driving insights into like, how do we sell to this cohort of customers? Um, and I think being that close to the end sale and end result was something that I really enjoyed and really tried to take forward and will take forward from that role no matter what, um, is that idea of like, how do we make this as applicable to the purchaser as possible? And like, how do we get as close to that purchase moment uh, from an insights perspective? So how do we get the team there? 
Um, and then hopefully the sale happens and we can then kind of do all the, the, the look back and the retrospective and the analysis from there, but how do we make that initial sale? Um, and then it, yeah, at Amazon, so that's the kind of full circle piece is I'm now actually back in grocery. Um, so private brands, uh, I'm working in the grocery channel. So if you've seen the, the four or five stores we've opened in the LA area, uh, we'll be opening in some new cities that'll be announced soon. Uh, if you Google Amazon Fresh Stores, I'm pretty sure it comes up now, but right. um, we are not yet officially announcing. Um, <laughs> but they are, yeah, we, there's plans to open, um, you know, Amazon Fresh Grocery Stores. So this is a physical grocery concept. It's a, um, you know, on par with a, a Kroger, Trader Joe's, Safeway. Um, you know, it's, it's also has some special Amazon-ness to it. Uh, there are the right. shopping carts where you can just walk out of the grocery store. Uh, there are Alexas in the aisles where you can ask where things are. Cool. Uh, there's some new technology around, like if we don't have it, could we order it on Amazon from the store and have it, you know, delivered because we're Amazon. Um, so it's fun. It's, it's, again, it's fun to tell people I work at Amazon. They then think I'm very technologically savvy or have these like very heavy <laughs> skills. And I am building private brands uh, for a physical grocery store. So it's about the most analog thing I could be doing at Amazon. Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting. And it's, it's interesting how you're able to sort of start to layer in, like you said, the Amazon-ness uh, mm -hmm. in, in a physical grocery concept. So, uh, so, the, so that's the high tech side. Now we're going to get like super low tech, yeah. super low tech. Yes. Uh, now, first of all, I need to say, I feel the need to say that when I was a kid in my neighborhood, uh, the, the local wiffle ball field was my backyard. So it was my home turf. Mm -hmm. I was the Babe Ruth of my neighborhood, right? I smote many a pitcher who tried to come in with some fancy curve ball. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would, I would send the ball, you know, over the garage and left or over the gate and right. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was my thing. You know, I just, I owned it, but I thought I owned it, but I wasn't a world champion. So let's, let's talk some <laughs> wiffle ball, huh? Let's talk some wiffle ball. Ooh, ah, so yes, yeah, so um, so with the ball, just again, just to make sure everyone knows, it's the the skinny yellow bat, the white ball with the holes on top, um, and I am a four time world wiffle ball champion. Um, awesome! How yes. rock and roll is that? I mean, come on. Yes, <laughs> I will believe <laughs> that. Um, and so our uh, my origin story, I think, is similar to everyone else's in the sport. Is neighborhood kids got together and played. Um, you know, it was definitely a like rite of passage for the, you know, the older kids to invite the younger kids into the game once they got big enough. And, um, you know, you get your groups of friends, you know, who one who's better, who's worse and kind of a social status piece of it. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all fun. Like it's all people just there to really get outside, have fun, play the game. Great. Um, we've taken it to the next level. Um, so we play in a slow pitch wiffle ball tournament. Uh, I say we play and we also play in and now run uh, the world's longest running and occasionally largest wiffle ball tournament in the country. Uh, so this year was the 41st uh, iteration of this tournament. So it started back in 1980. Wow. Uh, with eight, <laughs> eight teams in Mishawaka, Indiana. So it started before I was born. And our team got involved just through some family connections to that initial, you know, eight or nine teams. Um, and our pitcher uh, has been playing since he was like seven or eight, same with some of our other teammates. Uh, and just getting absolutely crushed as kids. Like <laughs> uh, there, was, there was no mercy shown to them as kids. So we try to be a little bit better stewards of the game as we've grown older and uh, wiser. But uh, I was the last person to join the team. So it's a team of five. I joined in 2002. So it is four guys who went to high school together and grew up playing youth sports all through. Um, mm -hmm. I, mean, I can point to each guy on my team, each of the, at least the four, and say, you know, we were on a soccer team together in third grade. We were on a basketball team together in fifth grade. Um, you know, there was three of us that were on the same JV high school football team. <laughs> like, um, I mean, we just were growing up playing sport. And again, none of us were the superstar athletes in the high school, but we all, we all played. And then the fifth guy is our pitcher's cousin, <laughs> who's <laughs> younger than us. And it was one of those same things of, um, you know, bring your cousin onto the team. So he had to. And um, you know, as we've gotten older, he, him being a little bit younger had helped us in some of our later years. So the, the field of play, I can kind of quick overview is we play slow pitch, which is a big, big difference from the fast pitch. So fast yeah. pitch is where you just throw it as hard as you can. The ball does this and, you know, you close your eyes and swing. 
ours, the ball has to have a little bit of arc, and the field is then a triangle in shape. And okay. it is a pitcher, a catcher, two outfielders. And it is 120 feet down the lines and 100 feet to dead center. Okay. And from there, I'm trying to think of other like key rules. Pitchers hand out. So if you hit the ball, uh, the pitcher has control of the ball before you get to first base. Uh, that is, that's an out. Uh, beyond that, it's typical baseball rules, four bases, tagging, you know, you can. Okay. Not, not a, yeah. Let me ask you this. Uh, Cause you know, we obviously played with our house rules and uh -huh. you know, house rules can differ from, yes. from uh, field to field. So do you, to get a guy out, right. Do you, do you whip the ball at him? <laughs> like we used to back in the day. Is that how it works? Yep. Other, other than first base where the pitcher just has to get it. Um, if a guy is running the bases and he's off a of base, you can throw the ball. And it ha we, our rule is you, it has to hit him below the head. Okay. Uh, again, <laughs> I, I think, I think we kind of half jokingly put that rule in as like, again, which not a great thing to joke about, but like as the concussion thing, like we kind of do that <laughs> as a, a head injury rule. Um, and also, I think there were some teams back in the day, I think the tournament has gotten much more family friendly through the years, uh, that were fairly vicious with throwing the ball at people. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, we've softened that rule a little bit, but yeah, you can, if, if you get hit and you're off base, you are out. Um, and I will say those are some of the most amazing plays because aiming a wiffle ball is incredibly hard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so to see someone, you know, a lot of it's just blind luck, but to see someone, you know, 30 feet away, hit someone else with a wiffle ball is it's impressive. You know, speed. It's really impressive. <laughs> uh, so those are that and a robbed home run, I think are the two most exciting plays. <laughs> awesome. So is this, is this a growing sport? What, what's the deal with that? We, um, it is. So I think the, the roots of it are always going to be that backyard barbecue family reunion. Like that's always going to be the, the foundational kind of work for this, but huge growth just in sort of the alternative sports these days, I think as, um, you know, just cost of entry has gotten so high and specialization and all these skills. I think people are looking for sports that they can, you know, learn, play with friends, be social. I think coming out of, you know, everything that's happening now, I think, the socialization aspect is going to be huge. Um, but we have become part of a community. Um, that's this oddball sports website that's kind of started up recently. That's promoting all of these sports, like, you know, your bocce ball, ax throwing, yeah. all, I don't want to say bar sports. Cause they're, I mean, they're, people take them all very seriously, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's growth in your sort of bar sport type thing. I mean, even, sure. even start to see things like darts on TV or, um, yeah. you know, Cornhole or yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, I think it falls into that genre of like, you're seeing growth. Um, and yeah. we've, talked, we've, our tournament, again, has been featured on ESPN, Sports Illustrated, um, all of the, you know, the big sports outlets. Um, but just the nature of watching wiffle ball is like, it's, it's not a great sport to watch. <laughs> um, it is super oh, fun. I, to play. I will watch it. It's fun. I will play as much as I can. We, it's fun to watch and be part of it. Um, watching it as a third party observer. Um, it's, at least in our tournament, uh, because there are no strikeouts. So you can kind of take pitches, you can kind of slow play the game a little bit. Um, sure. You start to see somewhere um, just the, the you know, I'm trying to imagine watching someone take 30 pitches on TV is like, uh, <laughs> that's rough. But again, yeah. it is, it is so much fun. Um, I, you know, I've played now since 2002. Um, the only tournaments I've missed are because I moved to California like a week before the tournament you know, right out of college. And I, yeah. that. um, and then there was a year where I, same thing, so I had to switch jobs and moved to Boston, like two weeks before the tournament. And I wasn't going to fly back for it. Um, but other than that, I've played in nearly every tournament since 02. And, um, some member of my team has been there for even longer. So very, very cool. Very cool. Hey, let me ask one last question about yeah. the rules. Cause, cause this yeah. is interesting. So, uh, I could imagine like if you're an outfielder, and you're sitting through those 30 pitches, guys being like super picky or, or gal is being super picky, you know, taking all these pitches. Um, can you just crack a beer on the field and <laughs> just start drinking? <laughs> uh, you, so we, our tournament, uh, it allows it. Uh, we actually... Um, <laughs> you're not going to win, but... <laughs> oh, no, you will not win. Uh, we, <laughs> Um, we have tested that theory to the ultimate limit. Um, so we actually partnered with, so our tournament is held in Midlothian, Illinois, and yeah. their park district actually 
as part of our partnership, they allow beer sales through the concessions. And that's sort of how our, you know, partnership works with them. Okay. And we are very friendly to that. Uh, we all enjoy adult beverages ourselves. Um, and that's part of the spirit of the game. I mean, I, one of my favorite things is that Friday night when we fly in, and again, for our team, this has sort of turned into a reunion weekend. Think right. um, a buddy's getting married. None of you are in the wedding. So Friday night's kind of your free for all of just catching up and having fun. Um, we treat this the same way. So our Friday night is, you know, each of us has a beer in hand and we're taking batting practice for a few hours and just looping around. Um, and when we get out on the field, absolutely. Um, the Where we've seen it kind of come into play for teams the most is, uh, so you, the tournament is set up Saturday is four games, pool play, and then a single elimination tournament on Sunday based on how you get seated coming out of Saturday. So okay. like, like the World Cup kind of type format. And you'll see a good team go three and oh, and then have an hour break before their last game on Saturday. <laughs> you know, they're advancing, they know they're through. Um, and then all of a sudden they lose to a really bad team and you're like, what happened? And then you realize that, you know, once they started winning that like third game, they started drinking and then the fifth game comes along and it's kind of downhill from there. So, um, yeah. We've and we've seen some some definitely some teams struggling on Sunday morning after celebrating a, a successful Saturday. As well. <laughs> we've often been that team numerous yeah. times. Yeah, I used to play in a band and we played four sets a night. And if you hung around oh. by the fourth set, it was it was pretty messy. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, so a question. This might seem kind of silly, but uh, you've been doing this for so long, right? Uh, yeah. And you've been doing uh, insights, you know, in yeah. parallel. Uh, are there are there any lessons that you've been able to draw from your wiffle ball days that you've applied professionally or vice versa? There are. There's actually three that I, I really think hold true for me. So uh, the first one is steal and innovate and like just steal with pride. Um, <laughs> and that's not a that's not a baseball or wiffle ball reference in that case. Um, but we the way we started winning was we saw what teams were doing on defense. We are kind of firm, firm believers that defense wins championships piece. And we noticed a kind of quirk in the rules that allowed us to uh, just get outs faster. Um, okay. And we were able to take that and modify it for what made sense for our team. And we sort of were the founders of this defensive style where the ball gets hit past the pitcher rather than him trying to field it at all, he lets, he knows his outfielders are behind him and he, they would take their hands like this and just cup the ball and like scoop it up to him off the ground. Oh, and I see. We just drilled on that for hours and hours and hours. And which again, the, the idea that we spent hours and hours doing that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think back now, again, we would have been in college at that point. Like we had the time if, to kill, but if you want to be a world now, champion, if you want to yeah. be a world champion, you got to put in the time doing that now seems ridiculous um but again we, we saw what teams were doing and we kind of stole it and just made it a little bit better and made it fit our team and i think in, in the insights world i've seen so much time wasted and so much time spent reinventing research that's already done right or that's like 99 percent of the way done um but there's that need to like feel like an owner and i'm doing this and it's new and it's exciting uh, where fully fully embrace the just like if someone's doing something great, take it, you know, with permission and make sure everyone's aligned on that, but take it, tweak it for your need and, you know, get it to your team faster. Um, right. So I think there's that, that's one of the big lessons for me. And I kind of look for those opportunities now. Um, and that would have started back from wiffle ball was like this. We saw what worked, we made it better. And, you know, we've now seen teams take that to even more extreme from us. And that's uh, embracing that as sort of a pride point of like, we stole and innovated and someone stole from us and innovated and like, it just sure. keeps making the game better. Cool. Um, second right. one I really had was um, have really talented friends. <laughs> um, I think I've described my team a little bit as we all went to high school together, but our pitcher was the player of the wiffle ball player of the decade in the two thousands um, wow. by the world wiffle ball commission and <laughs> our, our left and right fielder both played college baseball. Oh, okay. Um, that helps. I did, I did none of those things. Um, <laughs> and I always tell people like I am by far, you know, a very average to below average player, but I'm also a below average player with four world titles. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, then again, I think that's an easy, easy 
kind of transition to the insights world of like, you know, have your friend, you know, have your knowledge base, have your expertise, but like always have that group of people around you who are smarter than you, that push you, uh, that have skills that complement yours and continue to, you know, kind of make everyone better that way. Absolutely. Um, and then the last one I have, and I think this is probably my favorite, is just swing hard and swing fast. <laughs> um, in wiffle ball, swing, you know, just taking like a gentle swing at the ball isn't going to accomplish anything. Right. So swing as hard as you can, swing the bat as fast as you can. And where this really, really shows itself is wiffle ball as a sport is really dictated by the wind. If the wind yeah. is blowing in towards you, the ball is so light, you can, you know, it's gonna it's not gonna go out of the park mm -hmm. um if the wind is blowing out sometimes you literally just have to pop it up over the pitcher's head and the wind will carry it out right uh, so again i think with any insights project i've ever done you know there's headwinds there's tailwinds <laughs> you don't always know which is which at the time and i think when you have the opportunity you you know you have an opinion you have it quickly you have a strong opinion and like if the tailwinds are behind you, that insight and that opinion and that idea will carry and, you know, keep moving projects forward. And the biggest risk I've seen is there's that, you know, strong headwind that's going to knock down any fly ball. You know, your opinion just kind of doesn't leave that room and <laughs> people kind of stop discussing it there. Uh, <laughs> I've never seen, you know, I've never really seen the negative side to, to just attacking and, um, you know, having that opinion, having that voice. And again, worst case, you get shot down in the room and, you know, everyone forgets about it by their next meeting. So yeah, um, I think that's the one, if I could tell people to take one forward, it's, it's both an insights and in wiffle ball, swing hard, swing fast. Cool. Cool. Excellent. Uh, excellent advice. Um, so you've worked for some of the best, right? Um, I've spent some years supporting PNG from the from the supplier side and, and a couple of the other companies that you've worked for. Uh, so you must have, you have swung hard and swung fast. And you must have <laughs> a perspective on uh, the current state of insights or the future state of insights. Uh, would love to know your, your thoughts on that. Absolutely. I think the future of insights is going to be this balance between we have more information, more data coming in than we've ever had. And I only see that continuing to accelerate as we move forward. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have all of the necessary people with all of the necessary skills to make that actionable. We have way more data than we can do useful things with. Right. I think right now it is still very much a kind of hunting and pecking exercise for I'm trying to tell this story and here's the data that supports it. Um, so the, for me, the future of insights is getting our arms around data organization, but then also storytelling with that data. And I still think that's going to be the most important thing is finding people that can do both and have those skills. Right. And I've seen that shift even in my 10 years of um, strong storytelling, I think, especially at the bigger companies I've been at. I mean, to land anything, you have to tell that story and you have to land the right, like two bullet points at the right moment with the right people to get that to move forward. Um, and the uh, so I, I teach uh, market research and marketing analytics at Seattle University. And I'm starting to see the hard skills really over index. Um, I have students in my classes. Who right. Have, brilliant, way better than me at any sort of programming language, coding language, um, you know, Excel skills, all those skills. Um, but, you know, they make a Power BI and then don't know, you know, they can't, they make it and you know, like this data doesn't make any sense and they don't have that business context. So I think right. it's that storytelling within that business context. So it's um, really keeping those together as we have so much coming in and now it's synthesizing and landing it at the right moment. Um, yeah. Really what the future of the industry is gonna be. It's gonna be who does that the best. And as Insights continues to sort of just, I mean, I've seen more and more roles get bigger and bigger in scope. And I think as we get more into some of these, you know, entrepreneurship type situations and startups, um, I think everyone's gonna to have to play a role in that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's part of why I've liked food is because everyone is a consumer. I mean, it might not be your brand or they might not be the target, but at the end of the day, everyone's a consumer in that space. Right. Um, and I think where I really, really push folks, and I think the future of the industry kind of has to go there if we want decision making to be done faster, is how do we get people to be part of that process? How do we get your senior leaders in a room with customers? Um, they're telling the truth. That's okay. Um, this is not necessarily the future of the industry. I think this is more of a current state. Um, but I know I've gotten, I, we, we always have those meetings where, well, the senior leader of wherever, they talk to their customer 
and the customer told them all the great things about all these Microsoft. As an example here, how great Office is. It's like, well, yeah, because no one's going to tell Satya that Office is bad. Um, right. <laughs> it's so it's 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 getting them just either in the process or just having them naturally be curious about the consumer. And that's something that I'm sort of on a personal mission on right now um, because it feels like we get pushed as insights professionals to be, hey, I, I want this data when I want it. And I want to be able to make these decisions and build that gut intuition. And, you know, that takes time and that takes effort and energy. Um, and again, an insights team member can help guide those conversations, but I think it's, it's how do you instill that? So right. um, like I threw a lot of things out there. So um, again, more data than ever coming in. How do we tell stories through that? And then how do we just build that like natural intuition within our business leaders um, to where, again, I'm not saying that the insights profession diminishes or goes away, um, but I think it's how do we take on that responsibility to, to help them build that intuition? Right, right, cool, cool. No, that's, that's, uh, that's excellent. That resonates with, with a lot of, um, mm -hmm. you know, what I've seen um, mm -hmm. recently in insights as well. So, um, so this is a podcast, right? Yeah. Um, so there must be some other podcasts or other media of various sorts that you find either enlightening or entertaining in your personal mm -hmm. or professional lives would be, I uh, would love to hear what that is. Absolutely. So, um, I've just kind of been on a big, um, you know, uh, like self <laughs> finding myself kick in my podcast. So some of those kind of self-help guru type podcasts, mm -hmm. um, and the two I found in that space I've really liked are Finding Mastery. Um, it's Dr. Michael Gervais, who's a sports psychologist. So um, again, he, I would not say that he is leading world wiffle ball champions through any you know, psychological issues, but um, he's, he works with a lot of famous athletes. He works with the Seahawks. Um, his program is taught at Microsoft as well. Um, but, and he does a great job of just really digging into like what makes super high performing people tick. Um, and that to me is just really aspirational, really influential to hear what, um, you know, someone who is at the top of their craft he had, I'm trying to think who he's, the ones that he's had on that I really like are the more extreme athletes mm -hmm. um, or, you know, Olympic medalists, you know, and the things they talk about of, you know, these things they've sacrificed to get where they are is always really cool. And just right. how they internalize, you know, a failure knowing they don't have, either they don't have another chance or like they don't have another chance for four years and trying to like work through that. Right. Um, right. So he, the one that he's probably best known for is um, I think it's Felix Baumgartner. I think was the guy's name, the guy who jumped out of the spaceship for Red Bull and like parachuted. To oh Earth. yeah. Yeah. He, he worked with him. Um, and this, you know, the stories around how he got that guy mentally prepared and like, you know, in his feelings and just it, insane, insane stuff. Um, so I really encourage anyone who kind of, like is inspired by super high performing uh, folks to give that a listen mm -hmm. um and kind of kind of a sister podcast to him is a guy named rich roll um ultra marathoner ultra athlete um really in interesting perspective on how he attacks things and his big claim to fame is he tried to do five iron mans on the five hawaiian islands in five straight days oh my god <laughs> <laughs> um he ended up doing it in seven um and again, just insane stuff. And I, that's to me is what's really inspiring is people who set these huge, huge lofty goals and then just attack them. Like I, that's always something I'm trying to do more of. Um, sure. you know, I feel like it's so easy to make excuses of family, kids, COVID, whatever. Um, and I like hearing stories of people who are like, I said, I'm going to go do this. And like, here's the insanity it took for me to go do it. Um, and then since this is a music podcast, I will give one music shout out to uh, Disgraceland. Okay. Uh, it's kind of a... Uh, rock stars plus true crime. <laughs> so if there's any true crime junkies out there, um, <laughs> told in a just really entertaining way. Um, but I mean, you can you can name any musician who's had any sort of legal issues, and uh, they've touched on <laughs> right. uh, in pretty good detail. I gotta um, check that one out. <laughs> yeah, I, I really enjoyed it, um, and it, it ranges from you know a, a small time drug bust for a famous person to um, you know Altamont and the you know Stones kind of things. So. Uh, it really runs the gamut. Cool, cool, excellent. All right. Well, on that note, uh, yes. this is a uh, music-oriented podcast, so rock and roll yeah. research podcast, right? So, uh, so you know what's coming next, right? I have to ask you. Uh, I don't know what wiffle ballers usually listen to, but <clears throat> but I, I suspect I'll find out. So, 
You're stranded on a desert island, Bill. You've got three records of your choice to keep you company for the rest of your days. What are they? Yes, this is by far the hardest question of the whole <laughs> podcast. I think of any podcast ever. Um, but... <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not trying to lob uh, softballs to you, but uh, no, that's true. Hey, sorry, um, go ahead. But this is great. Uh, so I will. I'll go. I, so in doing this, I realized I stopped listening to albums in about 2005 because that is my most recent album. Um, I don't know if I'm part of the the Spotify slash Napster generation, um, but I will start with 1994's Weezer's Blue album. Ah, nice, cool. My first one. Um, All right. It is just a punch of nostalgia. Like you put it on, and those first few chords of "My Name Is Jonas," and I'm like, I I know every word from now until the end of this album. Um, so I, I will listen to that album all the way through, you know, kind of just on repeat, no problems. Uh, I think very bubblegum poppy, very earwormy. Yeah. Uh, be enjoyable on an island. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I'll tell the story because I think it's fun. So I have a fun Rivers Cuomo story. So lead singer of Weezer. Um, I was in a previous life. I worked in HR as like a training and development type person. And I was at a training, like an offsite, you know, come in, learn this new technique. Great. And there was a guy in the back of the room kind of by himself and, you know, took it seriously, taking notes. And my coworker and I were like, this guy looks really familiar. And we could not place who he was. And like two days into this training, we realized it was Rivers Cuomo, the lead singer of Weezer. And we're like, why is he at an HR training? <laughs> so finally, the last day we asked him, and this would have been like 2006, seven ish when like Weezer was, you know, they had to had their ups and downs as a like collective. And he was there to like help learn interpersonal communication and facilitation skills to help like Weezer be a better band. <laughs> um, That's awesome. so, like now in my head, when I think of like, the rock and roll lifestyle, I think of Rivers Cuomo at a, you know, in a hotel ballroom at an HR training. <laughs> he was trying to avoid uh, ending up on disgrace land, I think. Yes. <laughs> um, so it was, uh, again, I, he, he, that was all like that was the only question we asked him like we did not fanboy over him but it was very <laughs> enlightening to hear that like okay rock bands have their same like hr issues that any other company would uh, so <laughs> that's that's the only rivers Cuomo story i have so that's unfortunate but um yeah moving on my second one is um death cab for cuties plans oh cool I, cool uh, uh, i think that's my my pacific northwesterner kind of coming out there um i <laughs> I was trying, I'm like, I don't know if I break up with someone on this island, but it feels like this could be the album for it. Um, it's one of those albums to just straight through. Um, it has an atmosphere. It has a mood. Yep. It has some, like just great, great songs. Um, Very clever songwriters. Absolutely. And it's yep. one of those I could listen to on repeat and have no issues just kind of zoning out for, you know, 45 minutes to an hour um, and sort of getting lost in the ambiance. And my third album, and this one, um, again, is so, this one was just a time and place in life type album. Um, it is Jack's Mannequin, Everything in Transit. Okay. So, 2005. So, this was a band that, um, it's Andrew McMahon. Um, so, he was in something corporate, kind of a pop punk band in the late 90s, early 2000s. This was his second band, and now he's moved on to kind of more, he's now, I think, Andrew McMahon in the Wilderness. Um, he did that Cecilia and the Satellite song that was popular a few years ago. Okay. Uh, but this album was all about his sort of first band breaking up and him moving back home to California and sort of, you know, rediscovering life at, you know, in his early 20s. And I would have been right at that same point, just out of college, had just moved to California. Um, so it's this whole vibe and atmosphere of like trying to figure out being an early 20 something, you know, in, a, in California. Um, it's very Southern California focused. And I was living in Northern California at the time, but like as a kid okay. from Indiana, it was all the same. Um, and it's one of those albums that just stuck with me forever. Um, they actually did a tour this summer of, it was the 15th anniversary of the album. So they did a, they were doing parking lot shows and replaying the album start to finish. Um, and we cool. were able to stream that and just, um, you know, kind of my wife and I just sat and watched it and we're like, yeah, because she was, she's a couple years younger than me. And she's like, no, these songs were popular when I was in college. And we just kind of, it just started this whole I had these very specific memories with this album and having a conversation with her kind of had some new making new memories with this album. Um, so again, encourage everyone to listen to it. It is uh, piano rock driven. Um, and 
just again clever songwriting and it's interesting because it's this transition from that like angsty teen pop punk to like now he's writing songs about having kids this mm. is sort of that transition yeah. moment that i think we all go through in our early 20s yeah uh, and there's a line that um i just like this it really resonated for me for this year is at the beginning of the year i was on paternity leave and not like wasn't exploring as much new you know no new real adventures so i had a little kid and um there's one at line in the album that's my life has become a boring pop song and everyone is singing along <laughs> like, I kept looking around and I'm like yeah like <laughs> that's that's where I'm at like I, I'm home with a kid and hanging out and you know doing the the very stereotypical new dad stuff and I was like this is this is what it is so I'm hoping for 2021 to be back on the road to new adventures and not the the boring pop song that um, honestly is probably a best case scenario for 2020. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah I, we, we should be so lucky actually yeah. this year. Excellent. Uh, well, this has been a great conversation. I, I do have one, you know, off the cuff uh, yeah. flyer of a question here. What happened to that sweet mullet that you used to have? Oh, that's always, that's always a, the heartbreaking question. Um, <laughs> so I grew it out for about 10 months. So I started it, it would have been about a year ago now I started it and I, I loved it, to be honest. I, <laughs> Um, I think the hard part was, was when I said, wasn't going into the office. The only person that ever got to see it was my wife and she's totally supportive. She's always been very much a, your style, do whatever you want, uh, type person. Um, cause that would always be the first question. They're like, well, what does your wife think about it? I'm like, she's, whatever. She's fine. <laughs> she doesn't care. Um, but I am, I'm thinking it's going to come back. I am. I will just put it out there in the world. Um, I think the mullet will come back or something similar to sort of big poofier, longer hair. Um, the one thing I did realize is I had to, in the process of growing the mullet, I had to get three haircuts because my hair doesn't grow long. It just kind of grows out. <laughs> um, so it was, I didn't want to keep getting haircuts and keep getting it styled. And um, I am, as I always say, at my age, I'm very happy to have hair that I am still able to do that with. So um, I am, it'll come back or okay, something so will come back. So the translation in my head is uh, during COVID, there's no one around to see it. So once COVID is done, then you can start rocking that sweet mullet again. All I right. think so. I, I think I can. It. That's why I'm kind of like, because right now we're we're not going back to work. I think it was announced until July. I won't be physically back in the office till July. Oh, wow. so that gives me another like eight, eight or so months to get to grow it back. So like by the All time right. we're back in the office, I'm golden. Plenty of time. Plenty of time. Excellent. All right. Yeah. Bill, thank you so much for your time. This has been a total blast. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing your insight uh, on the insight industry uh, and your, your good times from the wiffle ball days. So I, think I want to, um, if I can encourage people, it's worldwiffleball.org. If you would like to sign up and play in the tournament, it'll be, uh, I think we're looking July 17th and 18th in Midlothian, Illinois. If anyone out there wants to play, grab four or five of your friends. Um, and we would love to see you. Um, and again, reference that you've signed up through this, like heard through this podcast and sign up. Um, and we'll make sure we get you some, some extra special treatment in the tournament. Super cool. Excellent. All right, Bill. Thanks so much. Run the